muted. Good morning, everybody. Um, if you cannot hear me, please feel free to type in the questions box. Um, we are going to get started in about 30 seconds. I want to, I've got a bunch of people trickling in right now. Hopefully you can all hear me. Anybody can't hear me? Good morning. Oh, they're just telling us they're here. All right, I'm assuming that because nobody has typed, we cannot hear her in the questions box that you can all hear me. Um, I have put the, let me make sure I'm sharing the right screen here. Is this the right screen? There we go. All right, so I, in the chat box, I have put my email address as well as the department's website um, so that you can have those for reference. A lot of this training though is gonna be kind of an overview for you guys that are on site or in compliance divisions. If you are not at one of our multifamily properties that is um, monitored under the 10 tax uh, subchapter F, chapter 10.619, then you are probably in the wrong spot. What we are talking about today are supportive services with regards to the land use restriction agreements um, for the um, multifamily programs that the department monitors. Sorry, my screen glitched a little. All right, so we are gonna go ahead and jump in in the interest of time. However, I do wanna ask, I know everybody has burning questions with supportive services. I know after getting back kind of in the swing of things from COVID, we are all kind of relearning how to do this over the last year or so. Hold your questions. We've got some polls mixed into this. We've got a lot of good information in these 40 slides or so. Um, the handout is available on your side panel for the GoToMeeting platform. The handout is available if you wanna print that and take notes. Um, if you have questions that are very property specific, please email those to us. Please do not ask those here. If you ask them here, we're going to say, hey, we really need to look at your property, Laura, and or your land use restriction agreement for your property, and we need, we need some time to research that. So if you can email us with the property and that information, we can get you a better answer. Our goal here is for everybody to leave with a really good understanding of supportive services. Um, those are also sometimes called social services. So... I think that's where some of the confusion comes in. But um, what we want to have today is a very um, good overview where everybody leaves going, man, I really understand what I'm supposed to be doing. And I know who to reach out to if I have a new question or something pop up. So what we're going to do, I've got Andrea here with me, and she is going to launch some polls throughout the training. She is going to field the question box. So if you have a question, um, she might tell, she might not answer you immediately because what we're going to do is we're going to get through the training and then at the end we're going to um, go through all the questions and answer those because last time we went a little long answering questions during that were also going to be addressed. So we're going to kind of tweak that that format a little bit. But without further ado, I am Kara Poli. I am a compliance monitor here at the department and um, some of you probably know me from monitoring reviews or from other trainings. Um, Andrea's relatively new but kind of gotten gotten her feet underneath her so you may not know her yet but if you don't you will soon enough um and so she is here with me today and i appreciate her time so here is just the um contact information you can see our website is there as well as well as some phone numbers um the best way to reach a monitor or a department employee right now is going to be through email and you are going to be able to send that person an email and say, hey, I have some questions on this, 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 and this. And they can either set up a time to call you or they can email you back. A lot of times we like the stuff started through email so that we can do some research on the front end and then it's easier for us to give you a call. Plus, a lot of us are working remotely and we are traveling. And so we are not always at our desk able to answer a phone every single time it rings as, as in a perfect world we would be. So an email helps, I know, for me to kind of get that conversation started. If you need to mail anything to the department, you can see our mailing address there is the PO box at the top of your screen. If you want to see what our building looks like, um, you can drive by. We are across the street from the Capitol and down a little bit. Um, it's nothing fancy. Definitely would blend in if you weren't looking for it. So, um, but it is there and that is where to find us um, on any given day of the week if you need us. So. 
we are going to go over some terms and definitions to start this and I will do my best to not use acronyms. So I apologize in advance if I do use the acronym for something. Um, I generally will catch myself, but I will um, do my best not to do that for those of you that are newer to the program and just for the interest of this training being available on our website for new hires that you might have come on um, or new folks that join our housing industry. So the first thing that's big with supportive services is the land use restriction agreement. This is also called the LURA. This is the document that outlines what's required under the program for your development. So if your development has two programs, you have two of these and you need to comply with both. So if you don't have supportive services in one land use restriction agreement, but you do have it in another one, then that you got lucky, you only have to follow the one that has this outline. And that is all we're talking about today. So for supportive services, these are the required events and services to be held with regards to the program under which your development operates. Um, they are going to be tied directly to funding source requirements and to the QAP from that year, that sort of thing. And we're going to talk about all these things. And the QAP is the Qualified Allocation Plan. Um, these are also referred to as social services. Some programs that we're going to talk about today or that are going to be impacted by today's training are the Low Income Housing Tax Credit, bond, tax credit exchange program, multifamily direct loan program, which is home, home ARP, National Housing Trust Fund, TCAP RF. I don't believe the neighborhood stabilization program has any supportive services required, but these three that are listed there at the bottom, they are now, if you've got a newer funding under those programs, you might have supportive services in your home, Laura, where used to you did not. So we need that's kind of the purpose of you know redoing these trainings regularly is because stuff changes it's a fluid world that we live in and it's not um it's not static it doesn't stay the same we need to always be learning and always be um you know knowing about any program changes so in monitoring for supportive services the way that it's going to work is if your land use restriction agreement requires the provision of services the department will confirm the requirement is being met in accordance with that land use restriction agreement. So you guys as owners and on-site persons and housing partners, you guys are required to maintain sufficient documentation to evidence that the services are actually being provided. Documentation is then gonna be reviewed during monitoring review, beginning with the first review. Planned services with specific dates may work as your evidence for that first monitoring review. Or like right now, if you were like, hey, we didn't do a lot during 21 and 22 because of COVID, we kept having outbreaks at our property, you know, maybe you've got a plan for 2023 and that's what we're going to look at, that, that sort of thing. So we're going to kind of talk about that um, in this training. Um, evidence of services must be submitted to the department upon request. If we get a call from one of your tenants that says, hey, my tenant rights and resources guide says that they have weekly exercise classes and I've lived here for two years and there's never been a weekly exercise class, we might request your services then. We might request that backup. If the development's land use restriction agreement requires a monthly expenditure for the provision of services, we are also gonna monitor to confirm that that is being met. So that would be, um, generally that's under those bond LURAs. And that's gonna be something you're gonna to have to send in your, your invoice or, and your evidence of how much you're paying on that so that we can be sure that requirement is met. Um, if you see me shiver, I apologize. It is incredibly cold in the room. I think that the outside wall has been removed and we are just in the wind today. Um, so I apologize. I will try not to shiver while I'm training this. So supportive services are not just for tax credit anymore. They are now required under some of the multifamily direct loan LURAs, in addition to housing tax credit bond and exchange programs that have always required services. So if you've got a home property that you're operating and you've had it since 2017, your home land use restriction agreement is probably not going to have services in it. But if you just got some home funds in maybe 2020, 2021, 22, you might want to look at that LURA and see if there are services required for your home program. So we can't just think, oh, well, that's a tax credit thing or that's a bond thing and not think about it. We've got to think about it with all programs now. 
So where do supportive services come from? I know this was everybody's burning question when they woke up this morning, so I'm gonna tell you so that you won't be stressed out about it anymore. So in, in the government code, the economic development programs involving both state and local governments require these. So you can see the specific numbers over there. And if you are bored um, later, or you're very interested in this topic, you can highlight those from the handout and you can put those in your search engine of choice and it will give you the specific details. But what it requires of us is that bond applications will be ranked using the services to be provided to the tenants along with other items included in the statute. And the housing tax credit application threshold will be evaluated with regards to the services to be provided to tenants of the development in addition to the other items outlined in the requirements. And when we as the department are allocating low income housing tax credits, the department shall use a point system which includes the ability of the proposed project to provide quality social support services to the residents. So our goal here, while we're providing housing to low income Texans, we also need to be providing them those resources that they would not be able to get otherwise. So it's kind of a benefit to them, not just in rent, but also in life skills and some opportunity things. So you can see that link at the very bottom. And that is um, a good link to put in if you want to read all of these details. Um, otherwise, that, that's something you can always look at later, but that's going to be where these specific requirements came to be. So the qualified allocation plan um, requirement are that all multifamily programs are governed by the uniform multifamily rules and applicable provisions of the qualified allocation plan or QAP. Annually, the qualified allocation plan will list resident supportive services available for developments applying for funds. These requirements change from year to year, but the, the previous years are available online under the archives. And you can see that the link at the bottom of your screen um, has all of those listed and outlined and it also has the current ones. I believe the newest one just got approved um, and posted. Um, so that's available. So if you have a 2017 property and you don't feel like you understand what's in your land use restriction agreement or where it came from, you can go to the QAP under when that property was funded and you can look up what was required and you can say, okay, now I understand because they got so many points or they were, they got a kind of a leg up on somebody else for this, um, that sort of thing. So those are the kinds of things that would be beneficial for you to look at the qualified allocation plan from the year. You could also just say it's in my land use restriction agreement. I'm taking that at face value and I'm just gonna make it work for this property. That's what I always do. Just kidding, I totally dig through all the backup to find out what the details are. If anybody knows me, they know that to be true. So here's an example of where a qualified allocation plan would have had a lot more details than what a land use restriction agreement is gonna have. If you have a 2006 allocation, excuse me, if you have a 2006 allocation, you're gonna be required to provide services in conjunction with the um, Texas Workforce Commission and so you can see this is where that's required. So this is kind of where that came from. Um, just as an example that somebody got um, extra points because they, they elected for that to happen. And then here's an example from the 2012-2013 QAP. You can, get, you can see it got a little more detailed and it got a little more informational. <clears throat> Um, and these are these are not necessary for you to read. This is just in here to show you kind of how that QAP, that qualified allocation plan changes, <clears throat> excuse me, over the course of the years and how we get a little bit more detailed and wait till you see the, the newest one, it's real detailed. So here is some pages from the 2022 qualified allocation plan. It outlines it very specifically and it tells exactly this matches up very closely with what's in those newest land use restriction agreements. So if you've got a new property or if you are overseeing a property that just got their LURA, you're going to say, oh, that looks a whole lot like what I've got. But if you are not sure what's required for one of your services, this is the place to go because sometimes the qualified allocation plan had more details in it than the final land use restriction agreement had. So it's always good to know where to find those and where to look because maybe there's some examples here 
that you can go through. So depending on when your property is funded, and if you're not sure of that, send me an email and I will tell you what QAP your property was funded under and help you find that, that property um, QAP so that you can know what you're looking for. So we have a poll for this one. I'm gonna read the question and then Andrea is gonna launch our poll. Only housing tax credit developments have supportive service requirements. Is that true or false? She's gonna launch the poll now and it's gonna take over your screen. I'm gonna give it a minute. I can't see the poll, so I'm leaning over to look at hers. No, you're good. Because it takes over the whole screen. I do see we had a question about how to download the webinar package. So in the side panel, you can see where it says handouts and then it has a colon and the number one. Click the little arrow next to the word handouts, do a drop down, save that. It's gonna probably open in your web browser of choice and it is going to be something you can save then as a PDF document. You can print it, you can take notes on it. Honestly, I'm, you know, take it home, let your kids color on it, whatever works for you, whatever's gonna provide you um, the best resource to use. It's also gonna be available on our website um, probably next week. Um, the, this training will get posted as well as that handout. So looks like we've still got some people answering. Usually leave them open about a minute. Perfect. All right, we're gonna close the poll. Yep. And you can share the results. Mm -hmm. But right next to it, it says share. Polls are new for us, guys. So most of you said this is false. All right, so you can now stop the sharing. There we go. And that is correct. It is false. That is something that maybe used to be true, but maybe isn't true now. But bond stuff's always had services. So, so don't just assume that if you don't have tax credits, you don't have services. So a little bit more about where do supportive services come from. They are also outlined in the Texas Administrative Code Competitive Housing Tax Credit Selection Criteria, the pre-application scoring criteria for bond, the site and development requirements and restrictions. This section provides the list of services that may be selected to the owner or by the owner of a proposed development. The full code can be found online at that link, the texasregister.sos.state.tx.us. Um, and I know I said that fast, but you can copy and paste that from the handout or you can email me and I can send it to you if you're unable to copy and paste from the handout. So a lot of this stuff, there's a lot of this that goes in on the front end. So when you are upset because you have to have 10 points worth of services, Remember that the goal here is to help low-income Texans in ways that they might not otherwise be able to find those resources. Some changes to supportive services that, that might come up. A, sub, a substantive modification to the scope of tenant services requires board approval. So you're gonna wanna get with your asset manager if you're needing to change what's required um, in your land use restriction agreement. It is not necessary to obtain prior written approval to change the provider of services unless the scope is being changed. So if it says, and we've got some examples, but if it says that you're gonna provide parenting classes with a specific provider, if that provider changes, maybe the one that was listed in the land use restriction agreement went out of business, maybe they're no longer operating, but you've got another one that meets those same you know, requirements if they're required to be a nonprofit or, or whatever the case may be, you can switch that without, as long as you're, without our approval, as long as you are still offering those parenting classes. Failure to comply with the requirements um, will result in an issue of non-compliance. So that is something you're gonna wanna be really aware of what's in your land use restriction agreement. And if you are not sure what to offer and your ownership group or your management group is also not sure, please reach out to a compliance monitor. We would rather help you on the front end rather than have to come out for a monitoring review and realize that um, there's an issue that could have been fixed with just a simple question. Uh, required monthly expenditures. If your development's land use restriction ag agreement requires a monthly expenditure for the provision of services, the department will monitor to confirm compliance when we do a monitoring review. Costs that can be included to support the expenditure are those costs directly related to providing the services. They can include but are not limited to the cost of contracting the services with a qualified provider, 
the cost of notification of such services like a monthly newsletter. Other costs that can be documented and would only be incurred as a result of that service. So you can't just say, oh, I had to, um, you know, I had to pay electricity on the clubhouse so we could have these services, that you're gonna pay that electricity anyway, that doesn't count. Um, so it has to be something that is specific to that service. An owner cannot include any costs related to normal expense of maintaining or operating a development, utility bills of any kind, contributions or services, cleaning or contracted janitorial services, office supplies, cost of copy or fax. So you can't, you can't say, oh, I had to print flyers for that. You're going to have paper, you're going to have a copy, or you're going to pay for ink anyway. That's all regular operations costs. Um, so you also can't say, oh, I had to have my clubhouse cleaned uh, this month because of my supportive services. Your clubhouse should be getting cleaned regularly by either staff or a service anyway. So, so that's kind of, that's not stuff you could include. This list is not inclusive, but any other costs identified by the owner need, will be reviewed for consistency within this subsection. So if you're not sure if a cost is allowable, reach out to a monitor. That is gonna be my, my go-to answer for almost all questions about that. And if you are not sure, ask a monitor. We don't keep a list. We don't have time for that. We don't have the list of like, oh, well, this management company asked us this question. We do not do that. We want to help you. We are here as a resource. We are here to offer help. Send us an email, reach out by phone, whatever you need to, because we would honestly rather answer your questions up front so that when we come out, when Andrea comes out to do your monitoring review, she is going to expect every single person from this training to have perfect supportive services because you've had the opportunity to listen, ask questions, you've got our emails, that sort of thing. So um, that is getting the reach out to us, ask the questions. We want to help. We want to be able to provide you that information. So here's an example of the monthly expenditure, and this is just there for, for resources. This is an example saying that the property has 250 units. 40% are eligible, are required to be restricted at 60%, while 100% of the units are reserved for eligible tenants, and the cost per unit is $10. How much must the owner expend monthly? They must spend $2,500 per month on those supportive services. And this is probably a little extreme, but just for the for interest of a training episode, this is what we've included here. So yours you know, might be $6 per unit, it might be $7 per unit, you might only have 75 units. So that's all going to change, but you've got to do the math and make sure you are spending the required amount. So some ways to be successful with supportive services. Be familiar with the development's land use restriction agreement and the social services requirements outlined therein. Advertise effectively with your tenants about the available social services. If you or your staff are excited and energetic about the services, your tenants will feel that energy and they will then be interested in attending the event. And side note, for those of you that tell me this is hard, I get it. I was on site for 15 years before I came to work for the state. So I get it. I get it from a level that maybe other people don't. I have been out there. I have been sending out these flyers. I've been trying to amp up my events. I get it. Um, so you want to be sure you are sending out monthly newsletters with calendars. You want to take flyers to the apartment homes as the date approaches. You want to set up events on the social media platforms if that's something that your development has. You want to use any other avenues available to that development to publicize the social services that are being held at the property. If you have an after school program, send flyers home about the next couple things you've got going on with the kids once a week. Um, you want to be sure that you're properly documenting all services that are held, even if there are no attendees. So the next piece we're going to talk about are the who, what, when, and where of supportive services. The who is going to be outlined in the land use restriction agreement. The, it's going to tell us who is required to conduct the social services. What is also going to be outlined in that land use restriction agreement, and it's going to be development specific most in most cases. So if you've got two sister properties and you say, oh, well, they have parenting classes and we were built the same year, but you don't have parenting classes, that doesn't mean you can offer parenting classes just because your sister property did. That means you've got to go through what's in your land use restriction agreement. The land use restriction agreement is also going to tell you where the services may be conducted. 
generally this is going to be on site at the development or it's going to require transportation is provided at no cost to the to the residents so if you're saying that you coordinate computer classes or ged classes but they're coordinated at the public library you better have a bus that takes those residents or a manager with a suburban or something that takes those residents to manager with the suburban is probably a bad idea don't do that um you, you've got to have some sort of transportation to take them to the library so that they can participate in that. It has to be at no cost to them. And you need to think about how you can best help your tenants. When the land use restriction agreement is going to tell you when a service is to be offered, daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, annually. Now, everybody, hold on. I know some of the older land use restriction agreements don't have that. I get that. We're going to talk about what to do for that. So who provides the supportive services? We've got three examples here. You can see in that first one, it doesn't say who. This is a newer land use restriction agreement. So each service, if it's required to be offered by a certified teacher or somebody of a specific um, job title, I lost my brain for a minute, I lost my words. Um, it's gonna say that next to the service. You can see in that first one, it says a local tax exempt organization shall provide the following. That's an example where maybe visiting nurse association is no longer active. Maybe they're no longer doing this. And so you've got to find somebody else. As long as they are a local tax exempt organization, they can still provide those services for health and wellness. The next one says that the project owner has contracted the provision of the following supportive services. So there needs to be a contract of some sort. And at the time, this was the Community Action Agency of San Patricio County. In theory, that might still be there, but if they've stopped offering services, you would need to find out who in the area is offering those services and work with them and have a contract with them if the, um, the community action agency, as you know, in this example, goes, goes away. Here is an example from that 2006-2007. Um, we looked at the QAP, and now we're looking at the land use restriction agreement, and it's saying that they agreed to coordinate their tenant services through state workforce development and welfare programs. So the owner is required to look at those required number of services, pick services. Looks like in this example, they've got to have six. So now the state workforce um, groups or welfare groups need to offer those. And that is something you're gonna to have to reach out to those folks and coordinate that with them. Here is a what with regards to supportive services. You can see in that first example, financial planning assistance, health screening services, health and nutritional courses. That's an older one. That's an older land use restriction agreement that has specific services. The newer ones, because remember I told you we got a little bit more efficient at this every time we realized that maybe those that were initially effective are no longer effective. Um, so our newer land use restriction agreements have a, a variety that the owner can then choose from and there's got they've got points values assessed to them or assigned to them and so the owner is responsible for picking the number of services that add up to nine points you can see i've got that highlighted there on your screen and you can't say that oh you've got daily transportation and you've got ged classes and the transportation to the ged classes counts as the daily transportation those have to be two separate things where are supportive services to be held in the qualified allocation plans of previous years that don't have this in the land use restriction agreement it did indicate that they were to be provided on site or transportation to off-site services be provided so that is something that has been a, a thing for forever. Um, so now it is in all the land use restriction agreements, as you can see highlighted there in one of our newer versions. So for anybody with newer funding, this should be in your land use restriction agreement. It should be spelled out. And if you have a question on how to do that for a specific service that your ownership or your management can't help with, feel free to reach out to a monitor. We can probably provide you some examples of how we've seen that done elsewhere. When are supportive services to be held? So some of those older ones, like this one, it doesn't say how often we're supposed to have financial planning, health screening, or health and nutritional courses. So on that one, the assumption would be at least once a year. Now, if it says an after-school program, 
you probably need to have that more than once a year. That probably needs to be, you know, three or four days a week after school in the during the school year in the office. So if you are unsure on how how often to offer your services, again, reach out to a monitor. Like I told you, it's going to be my my answer to just about everything like that. But you can see in these newer land use restriction agreements that there's daily, monthly, quarterly, annually, weekly, um, daily and regular business hours, Monday through Thursday, that sort of thing. So these, this is now spelled out in your land use restriction agreement, and it is telling you that um, how often you've got to have those. And you can see here that like when we were talking about who, courses must be offered through an on-site instructor. So that's the who for one like this. You can't just have a CD-ROM for that. So now let's talk about how long do supportive services have to be provided. I know there are tons of questions and I promise we are going to answer questions. Um, social services must be provided as long as the LURA requires. So throughout the compliance period, as you can see in that first example, and if the compliance period has been extended, then the services must be offered throughout the full period of the property. Throughout the extended use period, you can see that in this the bottom example that it is required throughout the extended use period. If the land use restriction agreement does not address the period that is supposed to be offered, then you are to offer them for the term or the life of the property. So you can see here in this example that the supportive services are required throughout the compliance period. And the compliance period shall be a period of 25 consecutive taxable years. So the federally required compliance period is 15 years. So this would be 10 years longer than the federally required um, compliance period. So uh, you might hear people talk about being post 15 and how they don't have to do their services anymore, that sort of thing. That is not always the case. That does change with a lot of these properties and a lot of properties have longer compliance periods. I think we've got one that's got um, like a, a total of a 65 year term, which is definitely the longest I've seen. Um, so I will hopefully be retired when they they finish their, their term out. But for the, for the compliance period, you've got to offer those services. So for 25 years, these, there better be a computer lab, tutoring, job and educational enrichment, stress management, resource library, neighborhood security and health promotion at that property. And remember to change a land use restriction agreement that's outlined like this to say, hey, a resource library, we don't want to do that anymore. You've got to have an amendment to your land use restriction agreement. That's not just a wake up and decide you're not going to offer that service anymore. So now we've got another poll. Supportive services are only required for the first 15 years, true or false? She is going to launch it, give you all about a minute to, to answer those. Like a battle to see who's got the, do the right mm -hmm. answers. Most of it's false. All right. Everybody had coffee this morning. Everybody's awake. I didn't have coffee. My coffee pot bit the dust <laughs> right before all the bad weather that we had last week. Was that last week? Yeah. Right before all that. So I've got the, the old school coffee pot out. No, it will be available. So the slideshow will not be available via email. It will be available on our website though. And if you need the link for that, I will put it in the chat um, or you can email me, but it's on our presentation section of our compliance monitoring website. All right, and then share the results. All right, so it looks like almost everybody agrees that it is false. Good job, everybody. You are listening. That's what my, my son always says. I'm listening. So not all properties only have to do it for the first 15 years. And the 15 years is driven by when your compliance period starts. So if you are not sure of that, again, reach out to a compliance monitor. We are happy to help. We've got another poll here. Supportive services must be provided on site or have a transportation option, true or false? I know these might seem silly, 
but these are the questions when we get called. These are what people are asking. So that's what drives the learning points in our trainings or the things that we either get tenant questions on that you guys um, as housing partners um, are not fully, the, the tenants are not aware of it or they're not using the resources for it, whatever the case may be, or these are the questions that the housing partners um, email us with. And so we wanted to have a training that, that fully addressed what you guys need. Okay, leave that up for just a little bit longer. Hope everybody's warmer than we are right now. It's so cold in here. All right, we're gonna close the poll and share the results. Everybody got it right. 88% true. All right, so we got a solid B plus on that one. I'll take it. <laughs> so the answer on this one is true. They either have to be on site or have a transportation option. Now, if you answered false because your service is parenting classes and you do those at your property, um, and there's not a transportation thing, that's fine. I totally understand that. But remember that if for some reason something changes and you have your services off site, there has to be a transportation option. So another poll here, I'm keeping you busy right now. Services offered on site can be changed anytime the development wishes to change them, true or false? Or it's complicated. I forgot this is my trick one. And I just told you the answer. I have to find some gloves to work today. Ooh, this is a, a it's, it's tricky. Yep. So this one, I know that you're going to answer it based off of what your land use restriction agreement is at your property, which is great and fine. Um, but it's probably going to be the wrong answer. Okay. All right. Let me go and close it and share. So she's sharing the poll results, and it looks like it was pretty divided between it's complicated and true. Is that true false. or false? False. Okay. So let's talk about that. Remember how I said in some of those older land use restriction agreements where it says specifically what services have to be offered, that takes a LURA amendment to change. But in the newer ones where it's a points value and you get a list with all the points values for each service, that's okay to change. If you are offering daily transportation and nobody is using that, pick something else that will benefit your tenants. The goal of this is to benefit your tenants. Um, now, if you've got one of those fancy wrapped vans and you've got one person a week that uses that transportation, I don't think you should pull the transportation off. But that's also not my decision because I'm not part of your ownership group or your management group. So you want to be sure that you, if you have the option to look at your services and reevaluate, that you are doing that. If you don't have the option, but you feel like you need to reevaluate your services, that's a conversation to have with your owner and then they can have it with their asset management group to see what it would take to initiate a LURA amendment. So how often does a property have to offer their supportive services? Weekly, monthly, quarterly, yearly, or depends on the LURA? We are gonna launch the poll. Awesome. Ooh, it rained on me a little bit this morning. I was hoping it was not raining when I got here, and it wasn't, but it's still cold and windy. That's the bad thing. Everybody wants to live in Texas, but our weather can't make up its mind. My mom sent me a text yesterday that said the snow was coming in sideways. It was snowing and so windy. It was going in sideways. I was like, well, better you than me. That's why I don't live there anymore. Great. Thank you guys for participating in my polls. All right, let's see what we got. Oh, everybody got it. Yay. It depends on the Lura. Some of them tell you specifically how often they have to be offered. 
some of them don't. So if you are not sure, or you are just, you just want to be correct and in compliance, email a monitor and let's 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 talk about your property specific land use restriction agreement but for this answer it is depends on the lura so how to implement supportive services the services must be held free of charge to your tenants they must be something that the tenants could not readily get on their own so providing youtube videos to say that you are teaching them adult education or job search opportunities that's not going to be sufficient. They can look those videos up on their own. Um, you want to be sure you are keeping flyers, newsletters, and calendars used to notify or describe the services. So I recommend you keep an organized binder or digital file um, to, to organize your communication so that when you have a monitoring review and we need like you've got quarterly financial classes, you can send us the two most recent quarters or whatever the case may be for your services. So for, and no rent or fees may be charged to the tenants. Remember that it must be held free of charge. So you can't say, hey, you've got to make a donation to this, or hey, you've got to pay this, you've got to pay your rent to come to these services. That's not how that works. You have to let them come to the services free of charge. You want to maintain the documentation to evidence that the services are offered. That's newsletters and calendars flyers for the specific event, sign-in sheets must be maintained and available for all events held, even if no one attends. So you want to have a staff member sign off on that generally to show that somebody from staff was there. And if you had it hosted with another agency or another group, you probably want to have them sign off as well to show that they were there and that the, the service was offered and just nobody attended. Some examples to avoid non-compliance when talking about our pre-review documents. So this is talking about when a monitor has sent you a letter that says, hey, we are going to conduct a monitoring review. We need your supportive service documentation. What you should submit, a list or a page of the LURA with the items noted of the services provided. All of my reviews for the month of January did this and it made everything so much easier and a couple of my ones for February did this. I so appreciate that. So if you are on this, give yourself a pat on the back or a high five. Um, I'm only one of the monitors. I don't know if everybody else is doing this or not, but this is super helpful so that we know when you're submitting these sign in sheets and this backup, we know what you're tagging it towards. What do you think that goes towards? Because maybe we don't think that goes to that, but you know, in actuality, it does. You want to also send in enough flyers and sign in sheets to evidence that the required service has been offered as outlined in the land use restriction agreement, along with newsletters for 12 months prior to the review to show that the regular service, the services are offered regularly. So like I said, if you're supposed to have quarterly health and nutritional courses, only send us the two most recent quarters. We don't need the whole year. If you're supposed to have weekly offerings, Maybe send us six weeks worth to show that you really are doing it. And then your newsletters are going to back that up as well. If you're supposed to have weekday after school classes for kiddos um, or for homework help, send us, you know, six weeks worth of those sign-in sheets to show us or a month's worth. And then the newsletters, just send us what we need to be able to have it. If we don't get enough, we're going to ask you for it. But when you guys send us um, the whole year, which I understand this was not made clear prior, and so y'all were asked to do this. When you send us a whole year of those daily services, it really bogs down what we're trying to review to get to your monitoring review. So this helps us out and it saves you from having to upload everything, but you want to keep everything because who knows when you're going to get that notification letter from us. So here's an example of a newsletter with a calendar. You can see it's got, they've got everything outlined and you can see that it tells us when it's closed. Maybe there was a holiday. Um, that sort of thing and this is just their regular newsletter but they've worked in those supportive services as well and i can look at these and say okay so they're doing you know rainbow fitness every day or every monday they're doing all these things so i can tell that they are doing what they're saying they're doing and they've sent me the backup sheets for that here is an example of a flyer you can see that it tells the property name it tells what it is, it tells a little bit about the class, it tells us when, and you can see that it's offered at a different time. Maybe you close um, at 5.30, but your tenants aren't home until 5 or 5.30. 
Maybe that's why nobody's coming to your three o'clock home buyer education class. Maybe you need to think outside the box, talk to your ownership or management group about having one night, a lot of folks are having one night a week with extended hours to accommodate those folks that are working during the day so that they don't have to take a day off of work to come and meet with you. So that would be one way to be helpful and kind of think outside the box to get folks to attend your, your offerings. The sign-in sheets need to be um, conducted for every single class that you have or every single supportive service that you have. My brain went blank again. Apologize, been a busy morning. It needs to have the date of the event, the type of service it's trying to satisfy. It needs to have tenant signatures and unit number or phone number, however you guys wanna track that. And if nobody attends this event, like I said, staff and the person conducting the event can sign the sign-in sheet to show that it was held, but no one attended. So if you have how to repair your credit and the service that you're trying to satisfy is adult education, we're not gonna count that. That's credit counseling, that's a different service. Adult education needs to be something like a continuing education course. Think about high school and college courses and kind of what that would that, that vein of, of thought there. So that's the one that we always see kind of strange things assigned to it. So if adult education is one of your required services, please reach out if you are not sure what to offer. Here are some examples. Example one, the owner's land use restriction agreement requires the provision of an on-site daycare. The owner maintains daily sign-in sheets to demonstrate attendance and keeps a roster of the households that are regularly participating in the program. The owner also keeps copies of all newsletters and flyers mailed out to the development tenants that reference daycare services. That's what we're gonna look at when we do your monitoring review. Example two, the owner's land use restriction agreement requires a monetary amount to be expended on a monthly basis for supportive services. The owner maintains a copy of the agreement with the supportive service provider and documents the amount expended as evidence that this requirement is being met. That is what we need for those supportive services. A common cause of non-compliance is that each required service is not having an event held to satisfy the requirement. You may not hold one large event to satisfy multiple LURA requirements. So if you have to have home buyer education, financial literacy, and credit counseling, you need three separate events on three separate dates. Maybe every Tuesday you have a class or the first Tuesday of every month and you rotate these classes depending on how often your, your land use restriction agreement requires them. But you can see on this one, they had one at three o'clock, one at four o'clock and one at 4.30 that's not gonna satisfy their requirement. That's one event. So we're gonna say, which one do you want this attached to? So another example that you, that you can use to avoid non-compliance would be um, <clears throat> to have an event from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. for home buyer education. And then a second event as a brown bag lunch and learn from 12 to one for financial literacy. And finally, a third event on the same day from three to four for credit counseling. This would allow for clear division between events and would be accept, an acceptable way to offer multiple events in the same day. Maybe your welfare agency that helps you offer these is only available one day a month or one day a quarter and you need to get all of them done in one day. That's fine, but let's be clear and let's make, it, make sure that they are three separate events with separate times and separate um, coverings that they don't all flow together in one event. We've got a poll. Would we need to send in evidence of every service ever offered when there is a monitoring review? True or false? I hope everyone gets this one correctly answered. Sorry, my hand got cold and I panicked on the word. No, no. It's almost half and half. I, I had a monitoring review this week and they sent me stuff all the way back to 2020. They, and, and Andrea has the same situation. Um, if it's older than a year, I'm not gonna look at it because it, it doesn't have any relevance on my current monitoring review. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and close it in the interest of time. We wanna get to all your questions. So the, Oh, it's divided in half. Uh oh. All right. So, if you are not sure what to send for a service, reach out to that monitor and say, Hey, I do this. How much do you want? And they're going to tell you. 
Um, you do not need to send in every single service ever offered. So if your responsibility is parenting classes, don't send me all the parenting classes since the last monitoring review. I don't want three years worth of services. What I want is enough to show that you have had that. Now, if you only do this once a year, great. Send me all three years to show that's been done. That's not gonna be a cumbersome submission. But if you do it monthly or quarterly or weekly, that's a lot, that's a lot. And I don't like to read that much, just kidding. I'll read everything you send me, but if it's older than a year, not going to have any bearing on this the monitoring review I'm doing right there. So what events qualify as supportive services? Your land use restriction agreement should outline what events are required. If you are unsure what will qualify as a required supportive service, please reach out to a monitor for assistance. For example, this is my soapbox with supportive services. If the land use restriction agreement requires adult education, the development must offer something that would be akin to continuing education through an institution of higher education. Offering a class on credit counseling would not satisfy the requirement. Offering a class on expanding accounting knowledge or computer proficiency would be an acceptable service for the requirement of, of adult education. Use your best judgment. If it is a stretch to satisfy the service with a certain event, please reach out to a monitor and discuss other options and available events that would meet the requirements of the land use restriction agreement. Our goal is not to be those MENO monitors that show up every three years and tell you you're doing everything wrong. Our goal is to be available as a resource to you so that low-income Texans can have what the program is meant to allow them to have. So they are supposed to have low-income housing. They are supposed to have available services. They are supposed to have good and clean housing. These are the things that we're all trying to work together to get. So help us help you help them. So when do they, when do services begin? We are gonna start monitoring for those with the first monitoring review. If it's the first monitoring review and you're like, man, we just got through Lisa, we barely still have you know, all of our wits about us. You can have a plan. You don't have to have every single service offered at that point, but you can say, hey, We've got our computer lab, it's been up and running, but we're also doing these other things. Look at all these great things we're gonna do now that we are up and running. After that first review though, we wanna see evidence that the services have been offered regularly and as required. So if required in the land use restriction agreement, evidence must be submitted that they made, that the development made available on a regularly scheduled basis to local nonprofit and government providers of services space to provide outreach services to, and education to tenants regarding their health and well-being. So some of what we're seeing is that like the WIC office is coming in and offering um, comp like they're having coffee and resources available to the tenants um, on a monthly basis or that there's like coffee with a cop in the clubhouse. If your land use restriction agreement requires this, please make sure you're submitting something. Um, if you are not sure what to submit and you are not sure what to offer, reach out to your monitor and let's get that handled so that on your next monitoring review, you're like, hey, we've got this down, we do this, 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 and this. This is another one of those things that's trying to build in that community involvement between your property, your tenants, and the community groups that are available to those tenants. That is all that I have. Um, so we can go over some questions now. Do you, we only have one question? So, oh, through the whole thing? Or were, you, were the others exactly. like, okay. So Andrea's answered a lot of the questions, but now is the time to type in your burning questions. Um, and I'm gonna read them. So the question is, we have seniors, we have services. I'm uh, sorry, I forgot how to read today too. We have services in our land use restriction agreement at one development and have another development with social services across the street. If someone can walk across the street to the services, do we have to provide transportation? Can we count those services if they walk? So yes, you need to have transportation because you can't require that they walk. If you're phase one and phase two, you need to have those services at both as required in the land use restriction agreement for each of the different phases. Maybe you can, if you have a golf cart for your maintenance guy or your leasing guy, maybe you can do golf cart transportation service. I don't know how that works crossing city streets. I was just at a phase one and phase two and the streets like six lanes and probably would not be good, but you do not want to ask your folks to walk to another property 
in, in essence, these are two separate properties. You don't want to ask them to walk. No, that would need to have service transportation. Do we have to offer every service on the land use restriction agreement? That's a really good question. And it's going to depend on your land use restriction agreement. If you are one of those properties that has to have very specific services offered, then yes, you need to offer each of those. But if you are one of the ones that says they need to offer nine points from the list below, you need to add up what's going to total nine points. It can be any way to get to nine um, versus you, you don't have to, we're not telling you specifically what to offer. We're saying you get to choose and those can change. So vocational and adult education, oh, I lost it. Yep, uh, it's up one more, I think. Vocational and adult education is very similar. How would you define vocational? I would define, and Andrea can jump in here if I get this wrong, I would define vocational as something that is specifically tied to a job. An accountant is going to take accounting classes, that's vocational. An accountant that also takes yoga, that's health and wellness, that's different, that's not vocational. So adult education is going to be something like an Excel class could be adult education, a word processing class um, could be adult education. But vocational is going to be stuff that's going to be, you know, like a welding class is going to be vocational for a welder. It's something that is specifically tied to a specific vocation. How do we handle resident signatures if it is a very large event with over 100 attendees? Um, you put that sign in sheet at the front door, have one of your leasing agents handle in that front door like they're a bouncer, and you have everybody sign in as best you can. I get it, that's not always possible, especially when you guys are doing like your resident um, events at the pool and stuff like that, that's gonna get a little bit harder. But um, I think for the most part, you can have a sign-in sheet, you know, put a bowl of candy next to it and somebody's always gonna gravitate towards the candy. Do the flyers, are the flyers required to be in Spanish? Um, if you know that your property has a large group of tenants that speak a language other than English, yes, I think you should have them in that other language. Um, if you are not sure how to translate that, there, there are some online services that can help with that. Um, so, oh, Andrea is laughing. Um, so I think, you know, if you are in an area like an El Paso or a South Texas area that has a lot of Spanish speaking Texans, you are probably going to want to have or have those flyers in both, maybe do front and back. Um, I know, I mean, I managed a property in San Marcos and I did, you know, a bilingual option on both on my flyers. So I think it's worth it to think through that because again, the goal is to serve our tenants. The goal is not to just check a box. The goal is to serve our tenants. So the next question is some LURAs require a full-time service coordinator. How many hours is considered full-time? 40, I think. Um, that's gonna be a question for somebody higher up than me if that's not feasible. I think at least 30, but I think 40 is the definition of full-time. Um, so if that's, if that's your question and you want some more information on that, reach out by email. Okay, so the next question is, who is our monitor and where do I find the Lura? That depends on your on what's going on. You, we don't have regions as monitors. We are not assigned. Um, so Andrea might come to your property this year and in three years it might be me or it might be you know another monitor altogether. So if you are not sure who to reach out to and you just have a general question, reach out to me. I'm happy to be your point person. But if you've gotten a letter, you've gotten a utility allowance response, you've gotten a monitoring letter, you've gotten a notification of a, a monitoring review, reach out to the monitor that's on that letter. For, for that purpose, that is your monitor. Your land use restriction agreement, if you are a newer development, and I mean like the last five-ish years, it's gonna be in your CMTS attachment system. If you can't find it there and your ownership and your management group don't have it and don't know how to get it to you, please reach out and I will help you get that or I will help you do the public information request to get that. What else you got? 
we have three buildings, do we have to have the same services at each location? Um, if you have three buildings and they're all one property and under the same land use restriction agreement, then yes, they all have to have the same services. You would generally do those in a clubhouse or a common area. But if you're talking about three separate properties, every property is going to have its own land use restriction agreement. So you're going to want to be sure that you are um, maintaining those separately. And, and if that, if it's, Three properties that are all close by together and you want to rotate, you know, because of staffing issues and you're going to have your services at one, one, and then, you know, you, you've got to really think through that because you've got to meet every single LURA requirement for all three properties. So that might be an easier one to talk about offline with some real LURAs in front of us. What else you got? My property previously had a provider for our services. The company can no longer service our property. What are some resources that I can use to continue to provide the services without using a provider? If your land use restriction agreement requires a provider, you're going to need to find a new provider. Um, if you are not sure how to do that, reach out. I will be happy to answer your question and, and try to get you some resources um, if I can. Otherwise, you might ask that provider that left who they would suggest. Will dementia class fall into adult education? I think dementia class is going to be a health and wellness thing. I don't think that's adult education. Are historical QAPs maintained on the TDHCA website? They absolutely are. If you're not sure how to get those, send me an email um, and I can find them or I can be proven wrong. If a service is not specified how often it should take place, is having it once a year okay? I am hesitant to answer that because you guys are going to get an issue of non-compliance on a monitoring review and you're going to say, but Carapola, I told us. Generally, yes, I think that's fair. But if it says if it says exercise classes and you have one exercise class a year, that's probably not meeting the intent of that land use restriction agreement. So use your best judgment. If it says financial um, counseling, have one class a year. If it says credit counseling, have one, do something every quarter where you address a different LURA requirement. But if you are not sure, reach out and I'm happy to look at your land use restriction agreement with you and talk through it. So would a human trafficking class taught by a local police department be considered adult education? No, I would consider that the requirement to coordinate with your community groups. I would consider that like, um, a neighborhood safety course, depending on what you've got, but I would not consider that adult education. Does offering bus passes meet the providing transportation requirement? Absolutely, as long as you are providing them every day, not just Monday through Friday, not just from eight to five, as long as they can get a bus pass and it covers like a week, I've seen a week, I've seen a month, I've seen some different varieties, I've seen some tokens, trip-based, um, that's, that's fine. Are services required to be on newsletters? Yes, you would want them on newsletters that you are sending out. If you don't send out a newsletter and you just do flyers for specific events, that's fine. Um, an answer to a specific learning point, I would have to go back and look at it. Um, so email me that and I can we can find that out. If you are interested in a follow-up um, information or if I've told you, hey, that's property specific, send me an email. My email's in the chat, which I will put in there again. That's the question, that's the wrong thing. Yeah, there is my email right there at the bottom of the chat. So you can copy and paste it. I knew that something shifted with the full-time employee requirement. Um, and I think 30 is acceptable. I'm not sure how deep we're going to dig on that, but if your person is a full-time, if your requirement is to have a full-time provider and that person is showing on the documentation you submit that they're at their two hours a day, that's not full-time. That's 10 hours a week. That's not okay. That person also can't answer phones in your leasing office. They can't be the person responsible for unlocking your front door, that kind of thing. They've got to be they are there to provide services. That is what they are there for. I put my contact information in the chat box. Uh huh. 
two elderly properties, does it matter if our residents come to the services we provide to them? Some have mobility and just some can't. So, um, if they just don't want to go to the services, that's fine, but you need to be sure you're having the services at both properties, not at one property to satisfy both. Um, I, I think I've got it. Most of the reviews of ours are yearly. We do send all required services for that year are needed correct. Is that correct? Just the ones that are not required by the land use restriction agreement only send a few months. Um, so with the services, what we don't want to have is more than what we need, but we don't want to have less than what we need either. So if you need to send what you think is going to show that you are offering that course, but if you are not required to have a food pantry by your land use restriction agreement, while we think it's great that you have a food pantry, we don't need the flyers every month for the food pantry if it's not a LURA requirement. Um, so if you guys would like to network together, that's great and fine. I am not sure how to help you make that happen, um, but that is definitely something you could do some, you can look up the other properties in your area through our vacancy clearinghouse and you can find out um, the, their contact information and you could reach out to their staff and say, hey, I'm doing this, this works, this doesn't work. Let's go, you know, have lunch together once a month or once a quarter and let's talk about things that'll work. What if our company is a nonprofit? Can we provide the services if the LURA requires a nonprofit? I don't think so in general. I think generally that's going to be somebody else is requiring those services, but I would need to look at your land use restriction agreement to, to really decide that. Have a resident who has asked to lead an exercise class, does she need to be a certified instructor? I would be real hesitant to have your resident lead an exercise class if they are not certified, insured, whatever they need to be because you are you are basically treating them like an employee when they are now offering a supportive service so i would i would really be hesitant on that that's something i would say talk to your owner and your attorneys about that that might get you in a situation for adult education class would having someone talk about different topics that are for seniors be considered adult education adult education is going to be math science reading Think about the stuff you took in high school. Um, that's the kind of stuff we're talking about on adult education. So somebody is not seeing my email, so I will put my email in the chat again. It is tara.poli at tdhca.state.tx.us. Um, how do we get a sign-up sheet for supportive services? You can develop that. That is. What the one I have in this training is an example. It does not have to be fancy. It does not have to be anything um, super, super strict. There's no real definition of that other than, you know, what we've got is an example of something that you could use. All my land use restriction agreement says resident enrichment program. Is that just whatever you want to do? Um, yeah, yes and no. So it needs to be something that's going to enrich your residents. So a community garden, in my opinion, is enrichment. Um, after school services for kids, maybe get the Boys and Girls Club to come out if you're out of family, um, a property that's not geared for seniors. Um, or the, you know, bingo in the clubhouse or, you know, that's just going to be stuff that you can really, you know, allow your residents to grow. The other answer I have for you, because my opinion does not really matter, Look at the QAP from the year your property was funded and see if it outlines what a resident enrichment program is. And then let's go from there. So if you are not sure how to find that, reach out to me and I'm happy to direct you in the right course or the right, the right way or the right direction. There you go. Thank you. I don't do well in cold, y'all. And my nose is getting cold. So we do monthly newsletters and flyers, but do but do list all services in the newsletter because sometimes we wait on vendors to get back with us. So that's why I would say if you're doing a newsletter with kind of a plan, great. Do a flyer as the event gets closer so that they can have those specific details. I think that just answered the next one. 
That's it. How do I fix the one? Okay. Is it the financial planning one? No. Okay. It's one further up and then it's like nutrition, like a mobile nutrition that comes by and um, the families use their food stamps, but if they don't have food stamps, they pay $25 to get the groceries. Oh. So they're paying. I think that would probably be, I mean, they have to pay for it. So I don't know that that would count. I would need to look at that. I would need to do some more research on that one. Um, so do activities like resume building or education that support securing employment opportunities, would that count for financial planning assistance? I do not think so. Financial planning assistance is like um, investing in a 401k in, you know, doing things that are going to better your financial um, well-being. Um, I think what you've explained there is going to meet that job employment um, or job search requirement, but I don't think that's going to meet financial planning. What did you do to increase participation at events and classes? Um, I offered food. I would always make sure I had snacks. Um, I would always make sure that my events were um, kind of when my tenants could come. So not at two o'clock in the afternoon if I knew that's not when the target audience would be there. Um, so that you kind of have to look so I'm not seeing this chat. What is your email? I will respond with that. Um, so I have put my email if, if that's. Do all Texas properties have required services? No, there are properties that the land use restriction agreement does not have su supportive services outlined. So if, you're, if your property, your land use restriction agreement does not have services, that's fine. That's fine. Maybe they, the, they were not in an area where we're super competitive. Maybe they have a different HUD program layered and they were kind of given an out on that. So it just, it just depends. That's, that's a little more property specific. But if you want me to look, um, I can look into that if you want to email me. Um, our DVD is okay. We get vendors to come, but residents don't come even if property stays open later and then vendors won't come back. I think as long as you had that initial vendor visit and service, and if they left a DVD that you could offer for your residents to check out, or maybe you run it in your community room, that kind of thing, I think that's okay, but you need to have that vendor visit initially and, um, you know, do what you can to entice those tenants to come. I get it. Like I said, I was on site for a long time and so was Andre Andrea. Um, it, it it gets, we get it, we get it. So let's think outside the box and let's, you know, in keeping with the intention of the program, let's also do what we can to make sure these tenants are getting what they need. Um, are health screening services to be pro, to be offered by a health provider? I don't know how to read a blood pressure cuff, so I would think so. Um, there either needs to be some, whatever you're offering for health screening services, there's a lot of medical entities that will come out, especially um, because of our aging population, they are really, really trying to help out with that. So I think you can reach out to lots of those different groups and they're, they'll they come out, um, you know, they can do blood pressure screenings. I see um, blood sugar checks, I see resources. I, I see lots of things on that one. So if you get, um, so the next question is, what if we get out of nowhere a call from an agency that wants to do a presentation to our residents that maybe meets one of our LURA requirements, but it's not on the calendar? Can we have that? Absolutely, take advantage of that, get the service while you didn't have to do the work to find the person and then keep their contact information so you can schedule them for future events. I think that's fantastic. And um, I never had that happen to me per se, but, um, and I was one of those ones that had to have the workforce commission come out and do stuff and that was that was fun. So, um, you know, you build a relationship with these folks and that's the goal, That that's the goal, is to build these relationships so that your tenants can have services that are offered to them. Um, I think we have, I see people like milling around outside our room, so I know that they 
somebody has this room after us. But um, we have about 15 minutes left, so y'all keep asking. So will TDHCA ever, ever make this a lease requirement for resident like it is for the owner? I don't think we will ever make it a requirement for them to attend services. I think we will continue to make this, put this on the owner and the owner must continue to offer services. Um, so the next question is that if they're having a finance, so say a banker comes in and they're presenting information on how to open a retirement account, the pros and cons of investing, that sort of thing. And then they're leaving their cards that would say, hey, if you want to move forward with this, you've got to pay. That's fine. That's up to the tenant. The tenant got the information because they came to your service and then it's their decision to move forward. Um, if you're not comfortable with that, then I would just tell them they can leave their cards, but the tenants have to reach out to them to then be sold products. I would, I think that would, that would work. Um, can you clarify how the point system works? So on those land use restriction agreements, if yours doesn't have points, this does not apply to you. But if it has points per service and it says you have to offer nine points total, notary is one point. Weekly exercise classes are one point. Nutritional services are one point. Um, transportation, I think, is three or four points. So they all add together for a total of nine points. And if you've done these for a quarter or a year and you're like, man, nobody comes to my weekly exercise classes, let's change that one. Change it up. You can change those as often as you want to, as long as it's being communicated to your tenants and to um, us when we do a monitoring review. I hope I recorded this. I did, yes. Yep. Our home buyer education vendor is still only offering virtual classes, but it is available to tenants at no cost. Is that okay with the on-site or provide transportation requirements? If that is a live person that you can turn on in your clubhouse through a Zoom offering that everybody can participate in, Maybe you can, maybe you have one big computer or one main computer and you can kind of project that, then that is okay. But if that is a virtual video that they are watching that somebody recorded, that is not okay. You're going to need to find a different home buyer vendor for that one. I don't want to end before 11 if there are still questions, but. So the question that just came in is if our lawyer requires a nonprofit provide services, would having a nonprofit present count? No, the nonprofit needs to provide the service. So it needs to be a nonprofit. Um, you know, if they are a nonprofit that helps folks find um, jobs, if they're a nonprofit that helps um, senior citizens find um, medical care, there's, there's this is like so many options. I can't even think of a detailed example for this. It needs to be, you can have nonprofits present when you offer other events, but they need to be offering something to your tenants that benefits their, your tenants and that is an out, outlined requirement in that land use restriction agreement. Thank you guys for all the great questions. This, this is why we do these. And if we've missed your question, um, we are only human and this thing moves super fast. If we've missed your question or you don't feel like it got fully answered, please email me back. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might still have. We have a Zoom person that offers services and we do a sign up sheet and no one sign up, does that still count? We have, we have had a lot of conversations here within our staff um, and the Zoom stuff is not acceptable. Um, it needs to be somebody in the office. It needs to be somebody that they can come to. They can come to the meeting and they can participate, you know, as if they were, you know, because they, 
they can Zoom call a banker anytime with questions. The whole point is that there's somebody there that they can relate to. Um, if our land use restriction agreement says we need two hours a week provided to K through 12 by a dedicated service, are we at risk if we have not accomplished that? I'm waving at the people milling around outside. Sorry, guys. Are we at risk if we're not? Yes, you would be at risk of an issue of non-compliance for that. So you would need to kind of really think deeply about that and maybe look at the QAP with, for more information if that's necessary. Reach out if you, if you have more questions on that. Um, I can see if I can offer any guidance after I look at your specific land use restriction agreement. I promise I won't write down your property or management company. I don't even take notes on those things because I don't I don't want to keep up with I want y'all to feel free to ask questions. I really, really do. We got anything else? All right. Um so I'm gonna end this for everybody. I thank you all for your time. Um, I hope you've gotten a lot of good information. Oh, are we supposed to have a coordinator or can we do it? That is gonna depend on your land use restriction agreement. For weekly chore service, is offering trash pickup for seniors sufficient or should it be open to all request assistance? Let's, that's, I would think that that needs to be something they can, Yes, do trash pickup, but can they also call you to replace batteries in their remote? Can they also, not that you provide the batteries, but that, you know, just help or replace light bulbs, that sort of thing. I think there needs to be a little more to that than just trash pickup. Um, if you didn't get your question answered or you think of other questions, let us know. I'm happy to have an open dialogue with you guys anytime that you have questions about this stuff. I would love to help you. Thank you all for your attendance today. This will be um, posted. Oh, we had one more come in. After removing or wanting to remove a required service, how long do we have before submitting a request for an amendment? You cannot change your land use restriction agreement until that amendment is processed. So that, that has to be fully completed. All right, everybody. I hope you have a great rest of your day and a great weekend. Stay warm. Um, and I am available by email if you have any questions. I appreciate you all again, and this will be posted on our website sometime next week. Um, thank you all again. Have a great day. Bye.